and informal settlement. What's happening on the ground in Brazil and Kenya? Colombia Global Centers are a group of centers positioned strategically around the world by Columbia University. The centers facilitate collaborations between Columbia University's academic community with local partners to engage in research and education activities. This session will be recorded and the video will be posted on our YouTube page as well as our website. As we proceed, you can post your questions in the chat area below. In the, within the, with, on your screen below, you'll see a chat area. I would now like to hand over to our moderator, Professor Zahira Maknat, who lectures at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda and also at the Millman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Welcome, Professor Maknat. Thank you so much, Pauline. It's great to see everyone. Uh, thank you for kicking off today's webinar. Um, to all our viewers around the world, bienvindo, caribu, welcome to COVID-19 and informal settlements. What's happening on the ground in Brazil and Kenya. Um, as Pauline said, I'll be your moderator today. My name is Zahira. I'm a public health practitioner who focuses on global health and humanitarian response. Um, I'm joined today by a remarkable group of panelists who are here to share their lived experience and their work with you to help us understand what's happening in informal settlements in Rio and in Nairobi. Our agenda today includes a brief framing of the issues, which I will provide, an introduction to our esteemed panelists, a rich discussion, and then followed by your questions. So let's get started. First, when we use the term informal settlements today, we're referring to what is commonly known as favelas in Brazil and slums in many other settings around the world. Greater than half of the 7 billion people in the world reside in um, urban areas, and a quarter of those people live in areas we would call informal settlements. That's 900 million people and counting. Informal settlements in places like Nairobi and Rio, but also Caracas, Mumbai, Cape Town, are often defined by creativity, by innovation, by resilience, but also by overcrowding and weak housing structures and poor access to clean water and basic sanitation, limited availability of electricity, and other things that governments normally would be providing in other settings. And these conditions are allowed to exist as a result of decades and in some cases even centuries of marginalization and discrimination against the people residing in these environments, sometimes tied to race, sometimes tied to class, or a whole host of other political factors. And as we can all imagine and know, COVID-19 has only exacerbated these difficulties and highlighted the grave disparities in health, leaving us to consider who has the privilege to social distance and who has the power to stay home from work, and who has access to clean water and soap and masks and hand sanitizer and all the things that public health practitioners have recommended. Essentially, whose lives are we prioritizing in this moment? So to help us understand all of this better, we are joined by some brilliant colleagues. Each of our guests will share their expertise on COVID-19 in the informal settlement setting and describe the actions they're taking towards a better future. So let me now introduce you, and I'll begin with our colleagues in Brazil, and I'll ask everyone just to wave your hand so the audience knows who's who. So we'll begin with Esther. Esther Hamburger is a professor of history and theory of cinema and television at the Department um, of Film, Radio, and Television at Universidad de Sao Paulo. Her research includes expressions of violence, race, and poverty in contemporary Brazilian films, and she was the Tinker Visiting Professor at Columbia School of the Arts. Now let's introduce Chago. Chago Alves is 22 years old and is graduating in law from UERJ. He's an activist for human rights, a project manager at Jacare Basquet, the executive coordinator of Love Jaca, and creator of Jaca Against Coronavirus campaign in Rio. Welcome, Chago. I'd also like to introduce our colleagues from Kenya. 
Julia Njoki Nambura is a local human rights activist and a community mobilizer. Julia was born and raised in Mudare, informal settlement in Nairobi. A strong believer in women's empowerment and community development, she's participated in a number of sensitization campaigns. Julia highlights that she did not attend secondary school, but says that did not deter her from seeking informal education. She has received trainings in everything from climate change and waste management to fire safety and research methods. Julia has worked and volunteered with numerous organizations in Mudare and Kibera informal settlements, including Shining Hope and the Kenya Red Cross. And finally, our last speaker uh, on this panel will be Dr. Kennedy Odede. Dr. Kennedy grew up in Kenya's Kibera slum, where he experienced the devastating realities of life in extreme poverty. He is the founder of Shining Hope for Communities. Driven by the entrepreneurial spirit of the people of Kibera, Shining Hope became the largest grassroots organization in this slum. And today, Shining Hope impacts 300,000 people across 10 informal settlements in Kenya. Kennedy is also a New York Times bestselling author. So we have a wonderful group to hear from today. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to today's conversations. And thank you so much for being here. So our first question to help get us started. And for this question, I'll ask perhaps uh, for folks to speak in this order. We can do Julia, Chago, Esther, and then Kennedy. And let's begin by creating a bit of a shared understanding of the context in each city. Can you introduce us to the informal settlements you're speaking of and describe the current state of affairs in relationship to COVID-19? What exactly is happening on the ground? We can begin with Julia. Okay, my name is Julia. I come from Madari. Before COVID-19, life was better, life was good. But now life is different. We live with fear. We live, I, I don't know how I can explain that. Because in Madare, we are eating three times a day. Now we are eating once. Some people committing suicide because of depression. Some people having gender-based violence in the houses. Children are getting abused because of this COVID-19. So life is very, very different. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julia, for sharing. Chago? I think you're muted. Sim. Okay? Sim. É, eu sou o Thiago, queria agradecer a oportunidade de estar falando aqui um pouco sobre a campanha do Jacarezinho contra o coronavírus e falar do que é o Jacarezinho. Então, o Jacarezinho é uma favela localizada no Rio de Janeiro, ela tem cerca de 40 mil habitantes e tem uma das quatro piores expectativas de vida do Rio de Janeiro. E, além disso, é uma favela que possui o maior índice de tuberculose do Rio de Janeiro. Né? Então, diante desse grave quadro de avanço da pandemia do Covid-19, a gente resolveu fazer essas ações para prestar solidariedade a essas famílias que estariam em vulnerabilidade social. Um, so, thank you, Thiago. I'm going to interrupt Thiago every now and then, just so I can do the translation for him. Uh, my name is Teresa. I, I work for the Columbia Global Centers in Rio. Um, so Chago was telling us that um, Jacarezinho, the community he is from, um, has around 40,000 uh, people living there, and it's one. Uh, it's the fourth worst uh, life ex expectation of Rio de Janeiro. Chago, if you can go back to the last part you mentioned, because my connection wasn't very good, can you repeat the last part so I can tell everybody, please? Claro, eu falei que nós organizamos essa ação para prestar assistências ao grande número de famílias que estariam em vulnerabilidade aqui na favela do Jacarezinho. Ok, so regarding uh, Jaca contra o Covid, which is, which is the, um, uh, 
the mobilization he's leading. Um, so he decided to lead this in order to help families in Jacarezinho to have access to food and sanitation products at least. E, além disso, o Jacarezinho é uma favela completamente invisibilidade, que sofre com a invisibilidade do poder público. Né? A gente tem esse abandono do poder público com relação às favelas no Rio de Janeiro. E aí o nosso trabalho é mais para a tragédia que já está anunciada. E no caso especial do Jacarezinho, é com a Covid-19. So um, he's telling us that Jacarezinho um, is uh, an invisible community in the eyes of the public force, the public um, leadership. I mean, I'm sorry, everybody. The public government here in, in Brazil, they are forsaken by the government. And um, so they're still build, being invisible and um, they're combating. Just a moment, please. I'm sorry, I have a kid here. Uh, and they are... So fighting to um, fighting COVID on top of being uh, forsaken by the government. Thank you, Chago. Esther. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to be here and this wonderful um, panel where we can trace differences and similarities between uh, our countries and about what's happening on the ground. Um, Brazil has a complication here um, besides being a huge country with um, a very large part of its population living in formal settlements. We are going through a political crisis at the same time as a health crisis. Um, and this makes things very hard to deal with, but we have an amazing number of... Can you hear me? I hear a lot of noise. Okay, now it's better. Anyway, um, we have this problem of having two crises at the same time, and the result of the two crises is that the people who live in formal settlements are even more. Uh, Esther, I'm sorry to interrupt. If I can ask all participants to mute, to mute their microphones while we have the other speakers, I think this might help. Okay, so I was saying that uh, because we have a political crisis on top of the health crisis, our situation is even more dramatic and the inequalities are uh, being even more harsh at this point. But we have an amazing number of initiatives of solidarity, and many of them are patients and to actually carry the situation and we hope that um, this will uh, enable us to get out of the stronger than if we think that a number of of new leaders will emerge from facing those challenges we have to face now. The sound is hard. Thank you very much, Esther. The sound is pretty bad. I'm wondering if you can pause. Dr. Nyambura, if you can mute your microphone, please. I think we can have 
um, a better sound for everybody. All Should right. we listen to Professor Hamburger again? Or did everybody um, get the message? Professor Hamburger, do you mind um, maybe not repeating the whole thing, but just your your last uh, uh, last bit of statement or information you'd like us to hear again? Okay, my last state was, statement was that we have we we can see that we have a such a large number of solidarity movements on the ground that perhaps we will be able to emerge from this crisis with a number of new leaders and new parameters of life mm -hmm. so this is to end with um some sense of future of a better future thank you so much uh thank you to all three of you for for sharing a bit about the context that you're living and working in um giving us a sense of i think um, how people are feeling a bit of description around fear and issues around mental health and food security but also highlighting for us the kinds of solutions that exist in your communities that are coming forward and these issues around uh, community solidarity. So thank you so much for setting the stage. Um, there were a few important themes, I think, that were arising from your descriptions. And I thought perhaps the best next step would be for us to think about and talk about and discuss those themes a bit. And before we open up near the end of this session for Q&A from the audience. So thanks to the audience for bearing with our technical difficulties. Hopefully it all is coming across clear to you now. Um, so the first area I wanted to highlight um, was a little bit about the relationship between governments and communities. This issue of hi the historical relationship between governments and communities and the trust or the lack of trust that exists between them. And so I'd like to ask you to describe for us a bit more about the historical relationship between the residents of the informal settlements you're talking about and their governments and how you think that historical relationship is tied to today's coronavirus experience. And perhaps we can begin uh, again with Professor Esther, then Chago, then Julia. Well, um, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, uh, Brazil has emerged from 30 years of democracy, like in, in the late 1980s, we had a strong popular movement against dictatorship. And this movement was so strong that it was able to um, make a new constitution. And our constitution, despite being very long and full of details, it has allowed us to build one of the largest universal public health systems in the world and um, and also a strong education system that includes free public universities not for all um, at least uh, not until now but there is a public free university system in Brazil. So for the last 30 years, Brazil has moved against the Western global neoliberal wave. And unfortunately, what we see now is a strong reactionary, and this is literal reaction, against what was built in the last 30 years. Um, Brazil has transformed itself in the last 30 years because 30 years of solid investment in health and education has allowed a number of people coming from communities who had never had access to uh, university education, to college education, to have access to this education. So we now 
see a very perverse situation, which is the combination of this reaction against the changes uh, we saw, uh, the political reactions with the health challenges that the whole world is facing. So we have a double challenge here, which is to fight the disease and to fight the political attack on democracy and on the strong social advancements of the past, recent past. Thank you so much for sharing. Chago, would you like to build on that? Então, é... Eu penso que após a, a nossa luta pela libertação, eu digo, eu, é, nós fomos direto das senzalas para as favelas, né? diferente de outros povos que aqui se estabeleceram. O povo negro tem o direito à terra negada. E a partir daí, não foram pensadas nenhumas políticas públicas para a inclusão dessas pessoas. So I'm going to interrupt Chago so I can translate. He's saying that, um, so the fight for freedom, the fight for freedom from um, black people here in Brazil. So they left the, the um, slave houses and went straight into the favelas. Chago, if you can repeat the last bit, please. Eu disse que diferente dos outros povos que se estabeleceram, O povo negro escravizado teve seu direito à terra negado. So, unlike other people that managed to settle, uh, enslaved people had their rights denied. E que não foram pensadas nenhumas políticas públicas para a inclusão dessas pessoas. E... Can you repeat that again, Chago, please? Não foi pensada nenhuma política pública para a inclusão dessas pessoas. And no public policy was thought for uh, those people specifically. E, e aí essa a perpetuação dessa política é, faz com que o Estado faça um controle social de alguns grupos sociais, que são pessoas negras, pessoas faveladas, pessoas pobres, e essas pessoas são marginalizadas pelo poder público. Isso incide diretamente so, nas favelas. So, of course, with the marginalization of these folks, uh, these people, um, public policy wouldn't be able to reach them or wouldn't want to reach them, and they keep getting marginalized in the favelas, in the settlements. E é isso. As favelas são um local de saneamento básico precário, sem moradia digna, sem creche, sem escola, sem educação cultural. So, favelas, favelas here are... Um, a place where there are no formal, uh, where there's no sanitation, there are no schools, there are no basic uh, services. E os próprios moradores buscam essa cidadania de forma constante. A gente luta pela garantia dos nossos direitos. Luta para que a favela so, seja reconhecida enquanto cidade. So, uh, people who live in the favelas are constantly struggling and fighting to have their basic rights recognized, and they also fight to implement the, the, the basic services themselves. E se não fosse essa, essa articulação dos próprios moradores, é, de nada seria a favela. Nós não teríamos nada e estaríamos numa situação muito pior. And if it wasn't for the articulation of people living in the favelas themselves and their organizations, they would be, they would be left with nothing. So they have no choice but to organize and mobilize. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chago. I appreciate um, hearing a little bit about the context within um, the favelas in this area and also transitioning to our colleagues who are working in Kenya. Julia, would you like to unmute and share? Okay, thank you. Okay, here in, in Madera settlement, we are very different. Don't trust government. We have a good constitution. 
which is chapter four bill of right, which recommended about health, food, and education, but that is not integrated. Madara, we cannot access health facilities of government. If you go there, they write uh, this, we call it displication. Go and buy medicine. No medicines, no x ray, no, there is nothing there. And you have to use NHIF. Madara, we cannot afford NHIF. We are living hand to mouth. What you get, that is what you will eat, and that's what you will survive for it. We don't have water. Clean water. And our constitution say adequate clean water. But in Madara, we cannot access clean water. We cannot access anything which is coming from government. Like now in COVID-19, Matiangi speak in KICC, broad light, saying that we have food for people of Madari. Right now, government don't distribute food. Only several organizations and several people who are well-wishers helping people from Madari. So Madari, we are suffering. Julia, thank you so much for, for sharing a bit more about the relationship between government and the community in Mudare, and also about the current state of affairs in relationship to resources for COVID-19, but really for just life in general. Um, and so I really appreciate all of you being able to describe a bit about the current state of affairs, but also how important these relationships are between government and citizens, right, or governance and residents, and how if those relationships are poor prior to something like a pandemic, that being able to respond accordingly is difficult and problematic, um, and, is, and is full of the marginalization and the oppression that has existed pre the, the pandemic, pre-coronavirus. So thank you for highlighting that for our, our viewers and for this discussion so that we can think more about history and its impact on the current. Um, one of the other themes that I think is also coming out of the discussion that, that you all are sharing is around this issue of communication. And so you've talked a little bit about this poor relationship between governments and informal settlements impacting communication limited communication about coronavirus. So what is it? Um, how do you prevent it? Where can you get treatment if you can? How do you get access to, to water? Um, can you get access to water? Um, how do you get um, financial support or food support or these other things that, that should be available for people in poverty? And so you're, you've talked a little bit about that and I'm wondering if knowing that in the midst of a pandemic information is so important. Can you tell us more about how information is currently being shared with residents of the settlements and how information is being shared between residents and other stakeholders? Um, and perhaps we can start that um, with uh, Chago, Julia, and then Esther. Oi. É... Então... Existem vários é, coletivos de favela comprometidos em gerir a crise do coronavírus de vírus em territórios vulneráveis. né? E como cada favela tem a sua particularidade, as estratégias de conscientização são feitas de maneiras diferentes. So, um, Thiago is saying that um, the campaigns for communication and awareness on uh, coronavirus is done differently uh, according to uh, each place. Aqui no Jacarezinho, nós já atendemos cerca de 1.300 famílias e junto a essa entrega de cestas básicas, kit higiene, kit bebês, nós entregamos adesivo com dicas de higienização, de como se deve lavar as mãos, como se deve higienizar a casa da melhor maneira e de quanto é importante utilizar a máscara. So in Jacarezinho, uh, he has already helped uh, 1,300 families by delivering uh, uh, basic food supplies, uh, uh, hygiene uh, kits and, babe, and, and, and products for babies uh, specifically, but they're also working on uh, communicating with this family 
families with basic information such as washing your hands and making sure that you're wearing uh, masks at all times. Basic information is being shared. A gente também fez uma parceria com a clínica da família daqui da região. E quando as pessoas vêm receber as cestas, é, os agentes de saúde dão recomendações de saúde para essas pessoas. They've also done a partnership with the local um, family clinics uh, in Jacarezinho. So when people go to them, uh, so, so um, Jaca Contra o Covid, which is his organization, discuss with the family clinic on how to best share information uh, and best share, um, uh, well, basic information with these families. So Jacarezinho is acting um, straight with these folks, but, but also the, the family clinics are also uh, reaching out to them. Uh, e além disso, a gente procura fazer também post nas redes sociais dos grupos do Jacarezinho, quanto à importância de se manter o isolamento social, mas ainda assim é muito difícil fazer essa comunicação, porque essas pessoas são bombardeadas por fake news e por desinformação, né? Um, he's saying that they also use social media a lot to share uh, this information, but they are competing against uh, a lot of fake news being shared here as well. Um, so this is one of the strategies that they're using. E, e é isso, a gente tem um presidente que não converge com a OMS quanto o destino da doença. Isso influencia diretamente na opinião pública. So he's saying that we have a president here in Brazil that does not agree with the World, World Health Organization. And of course, this has high impacts in the public health uh, uh, in the communities and elsewhere in Brazil. E para encerrar... Nós também podemos observar que muitas pessoas só acreditam no grau de letalidade da doença quando ela simplesmente se aproxima, quando chega no familiar, quando chega no vizinho, e aí infelizmente já é tarde demais. And he's noting that um, people only take the disease seriously once it actually hits them. So once a neighbor has died or a family member has died, if they are not direct uh, impact, um, if they are not directly impacted by the disease, they tend to uh, oversee it and not take it seriously. Thank you so much, Chago, for describing a bit about how communication about COVID is um, happening in the informal settlement, but also about what you and others are doing to respond. Um, perhaps we can transition to Esther. Feel free to unmute yourself and share. I, I think Tiago has um, started to describe the challenge we have here of uh, having a president who spread fake news. I mean, um, we have actually a war of information in place. Um, who is telling the truth? You have like the main leader in the country telling people that they can approach it, uh, each other without using masks that they should take this medicine that and we and we just learned that the u.s has sent tons of uh, medicine this medicine that it, it is used against uh, one disease and they wanted us to use it against this disease and it's not indicated um, so Fake, what is fake news? Uh, what <laughs> if the president is spreading fake news and fake images? So uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge to inform people and to, uh, to convince them that they should stay home. And in informal settlements, it's even more challenging because we know that the houses are small and there are many people living in the same house so um, here they started to create places and uh, to help people with mild symptoms to stay away from their families so that they won't contaminate each other so but 
it's not easy to convince people to come to these places when the places exist. Um, and all this is, I mean, we could have prepared, better prepared if we had a centralized um, effort but we don't. So the challenge here is that we are fragmented and the, and the strategies of communications is also fragmented. So Tiago was telling us the other day that they are making a film to help to uh, communicate with people and, and to tell them how they should um, clean things and, and, and the care that, that are needed to to fight COVID-19 so we but we have a lot of uh, grassroots movements making um, films and and making um, news to try to teach their neighbors how to avoid the disease but it's very hard to grasp the whole process, although we have like many different examples of very strong work that has been done in very different uh, organizations from all kinds of organizations. Like Conzilla is a punk uh, YouTube site that has some um, video, music videos on, the, on Corona and um, Desabafa is another initiative that is now, they have like a, a program with um, another organization and they're giving, they, they are giving the money for people to make films about uh, the virus. So there are tons of, things going on, but they are all fragmented. There is not one public policy of like communications. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you, Chago, for sharing a little bit about the challenges around communication, but also some of the creativity in relationship to responding to it in the Brazilian context. Um, Julia, would you like to respond to this question as well in relationship to Mudare? Yes. Okay. In Madara, we have several organizations which they have plat of platform of SMS about COVID-19 and symptoms. We are doing door-to-door -door campaign and talking to people how to wash their hands. If they have any rumors, they can visit any any desk which organization have put information desk to get information about COVID-19. So we do door-to-door -door campaign, hand wash, distributing foods. We have food drive by several organizations. We have water points where people wash their hands, but still we have challenges. You can tell someone you can wash your hands and ask you, I'm washing my hand, I'm going to eat what? You take that initiative to talk to her and tell her important of taking measures like wearing mask, washing hands, and listen what COVID-19 have done in this country. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and I, I appreciate you highlighting, I think, the frequently in several of your responses, the intersection between poverty and COVID and these lack of um, formal supports from the government. And I think that's really important for us to consider because there's a lot of work around thinking about and responding to COVID in urban settings generally, but not thinking about and, re and responding to COVID specifically in informal settlements and um, being able to contemplate and then act on the issues around poverty at the same time that you're acting on the issues around a pandemic. And so thank you for bringing such uh, powerful language to that, Julia, to Esther and Chavo. So 
we want to talk a little bit um, before transitioning to the Q&A, and thanks to everyone for bearing with us with all the technical difficulties, but I'm hoping you can hear us clearly and well and have been able to do so for, for the last um, uh, minutes. So we've had a chance to talk, to hear a little bit about the context, to talk about um, the historic relationships between people living in informal settlements and their governments, to talk a little bit about the communication on um, COVID in relationship to being able to prevent, treat, and respond in these communities. And then everyone has shared, I think naturally already in your conversation, a bit about the community-based solutions that have come forward. But I'm hoping we can dig a little deeper and share a bit more with, uh, with this audience. There's such power in grassroots community-based action and activism that often fills the gap that governments create. And so in the absence of well-coordinated government responses that we've heard around in Nairobi and in Rio, but is existing all across the globe, communities have done what they always do, sort of responded and cared and um, entered the solution space. And so can you tell us a bit more and feel free to build on one you started sharing in the last section, but tell us a bit more about what solutions and actions have been put forth at the grassroots level in Rio and in Nairobi settlements and, and what's working. And we can start uh, with Chago, and then Julia, and then Esther. Nossa situação está voltada para assistir as famílias com segurança alimentar, com a conscientização quanto aos riscos de contágio. Chago. I'm sorry to interrupt. The, um, the connection is, is bad. Can you repeat it again? Okay, uh, it's better now? So, yes, thank you. No Rio de Janeiro, assim, eu falo pelo jacarezinho, né? A gente busca assistir as famílias com a segurança alimentar mesmo e com a conscientização quanto aos riscos de contágio. In, in Jacarezinho, specifically, specifically speaking, um, they're hoping to assist family with basic food supplies and basic communication on how to prevent the virus. Nas últimas ações, nós também conseguimos cadastrar as famílias que não têm acesso à internet no auxílio emergencial do governo. Um, and the last, um, the last few uh, uh, actions that they worked on was uh, helping families that have no access to internet on uh, registering for the, um, here we have the, the, the federal government um, has abled uh, a basic uh, income for families who have uh, lost their incomes because of the pandemic but you need to have access to, to the internet so you can download an app so that you can register uh, uh, yourself, your social security number. So what they have done is they've um, reached out to these families who have no access to internet in, able, uh, in order to uh, help them register for this, um, for this uh, income from the government. My Para além disso, a gente tem tentado estar estruturando aqui no Jacarezinho um trabalho de coleta de dados, de pesquisa e de, co de comunicação para que a gente possa ter uma noção real das demandas do Jacarezinho. So, um, besides that, they, they're working on gathering data, formal data from uh, Jacarezinho, which has no formal data, of course, from the, from the uh, public uh, services. So, they're working on collecting these data so they have uh, a better notion of what actually goes on uh, in Jacarezinho and what the numbers are in Jacarezinho. É, assim, é muito comum a gente ver as pessoas de fora, a própria academia, chegar na favela pautando o que os moradores precisam sem sequer ouvi-los. E aí a gente tem esse objetivo de é, subverter essa lógica para pararem de marginalizar nosso conhecimento. So it's very common uh, for uh, academics and other folks to come in the favelas and tell residents what to do based on the information that they have, on the data that they have, 
uh, instead of actually sitting down and listening to the people who live there and who are dealing day to day uh, with their own struggles and their own successes as well. So the collection of this data is, is, is to help them empower themselves with actual information uh, and, and spread the correct information to those who come in um, and think they can just um, say what needs to be done without actually knowing what's happening on the ground. É, nessa perspectiva, eu acredito que, assim, nós da favela, nós enquanto povo preto, nós somos produtores de conhecimento também. E o nosso conhecimento merece ser valorizado. Acho que, assim, se as pessoas de fora querem ajudar as favelas de fato, seria legal que elas financiassem projetos que já existem nas favelas. So he's saying that... Uh... Black people and people from the favelas are uh, generators of knowledge, uh, and that instead of having uh, folks come in and tell, you know, asking them what they could do, maybe they can finance projects that are already being led by people who are from the favelas and leading uh, programs that are actually working for them. E para encerrar, nós temos provado isso nessa corona crise, né? Nós somos capazes de nos mobilizar e criar espaços para que a gente atue de forma bastante incisiva. É por isso que esses espaços têm que ser ampliados. So he's saying that uh, the Corona crisis has actually been a perfect example of how they can organize and mobilize and actually deploy services that are helpful for their communities and they should be heard and they should they should have a voice an active voice. Uh, um, in society in general, and, and be respected as uh, highly organized members of uh, society. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chago, for highlighting, I think, a number of, in, of important components in relationship to this issue. Um, highlighting data and data quality and accuracy and data that's community driven and community led. Um, highlighting the kinds of work that you're doing around just supporting basic services, um, let alone what is necessary for COVID-19, and building in, um, I think the, the building in or accentuating the kinds of power that exist among Black communities within the favelas and elevating that. So thank you for your, for your thoughts and, uh, and for your work in this area. Julia? Can Elena translate for me with, in Kiswahili? I didn't understand that question. Sure. So the question, I'll say in English and then feel free to translate. So the question is essentially, um, if you can tell us a little bit more about what solutions and actions have been put forth at a grassroots level in Nairobi that you think are good responses, strong responses to COVID-19. And you may have shared already, and you can build upon the detail in your description. Uh, Julia. Wanaulizia yale mambo ama vitu ambavyo vimewekwa na serikali kama uh, suluhisho za haya mambo ya COVID-19 ama vitu ambavyo wewe mwenyewe ukiangalia vinaweza fanywa ndio future response kama kutakuwa na magonjwa mengine uh, tuweze kuishi vizuri na muishi vizuri na mambo yaendelee vya Feel free to unmute yourself to share Julia Okay, nikakati zile zinapakuwekwa ni kama hizo za kuosha mikono, kuelimisha watu kuhusu hizi magonjwa na pia kuprovide mask na kuprovide center ile itakuwa hapo 24 hours liweze kusaidia community bila hiyo hakuna kitu tutakuwa tunafanya juu tutafanya kazi ya kuambia watu waoshe mkono wavai mask but kama hakuna ile facility wanaweza enda wakigonjeka so nini kitu gani tuweza kwa tunafanya kwa hivyo ni vizuri tukuje na mikakati ya kuweka center 
na to, to provide hizo mask jusione vile naweza toa 150 ni nyo max na ili hali kwangu watu wanalala nja kwa hivyo kama inawezekana we provided the mask food water na security itakuwa tumeweza kufanya hiyo kazi Lina Yeah sorry um Julia is saying that um it's important that there is training for in future post covid-19 on uh, maybe a recurrence of the same or other um pandemics if they come up and people should be trained more on the um on proper hand washing on um the importance of sanitizing when it comes to these uh, communicable diseases and uh, she advocates she strongly advocates for a 24 hour center to be created for sensitization issues when it comes to such things and um, people who live in informal settlements should be included and uh, she st she says that there's no way you are going to tell people to wash their hands and buy soap and buy masks and um like put other measures in place when they do not have food to eat. People make less than a dollar a day in these informal settlements. So are you going to ask that person or rather are you going to tell Julia go buy soap when she can use that money to feed her children when she's even unable to feed them in the first place? So for her, she says that um, there should be a link between provision of resources and this training so that to make the lives of people who reside there good. And uh, uh, she highlighted on three things. The things that um, she's seen, of course, an issue there where they live in Madare is that people lack food. There's no water, there's so much water rationing in informal settlements and right now that, um, that's happening. So they're not able to do anything. So sanit sanitizing, proper sanitization is off. And there's also a big issue with security. So if those things can be looked into uh, in future, then that will be fine. Thank you so much, Julia, Esther, and Chago for highlighting for us um, some of the community activities that are leading the way and beginning to or already addressing some of these issues while also recognizing the gaps that still exist and uh, the partnerships that may be necessary in order to push some of these things forward. Um, I also really appreciate the, the honesty around the level of marginalization, the level of limited resources that are available. And, and while in this conversation, we want to be sure to be talking about that, also thinking about future um, panels and other work that we're doing to be able to continue to champion um, this level of um, inequality and uh, dismantling this level of inequality that occurs in informal settlements. So thank you though, thus far for sharing the work that's being done at the community level. Um, we do have just about five minutes left in the session, but our organizers have expressed that we can utilize more time beyond that. So just a note to our audience, thank you so much for uh, staying in with us and we hope that you'll like to continue. We will continue for another 15 minutes beyond the original time. Um, and so keep your questions coming. So we have one final question for this panel before we take the questions that are being placed in the chat. So this is essentially a closing question to help us transition a bit towards the future. Um, and we've been exploring the current state of affairs and informal settlements. You have powerfully shared what is happening, what is not happening, what should be happening. Um, and I'm curious what you're hoping for or what your demands are really. And you, I think Julia shared a few, but what are your demands in a post COVID phase in order to be better prepared for pandemics or more honestly, to minimize the marginalization in these communities? So what are you demanding as we move forward into the future? What are you hoping for? And maybe now starting with Julia, then Chago, then Esther. Back to Lena. Lena can explain in Swahili and then I will answer. Wanaulizia mahitaji yako. Tamewewe kibinafsi majirani wako 
ikiambatana na ya mambo ya COVID-19. Kuna vitu ambavyo umesha vitaja, venye utataka kuona huko mbeleni vikifanyika, nona, ndio watu waishi vizuri. So, kuna, kuna mambo mengine ambayo ujataja ungesema, ungependa kutaja. Yes. Kama kwa wamama, tunaweza kuwa to provide the sanitary talents na kukuwe na health talk kwa our teenage juu our teenage sa hindi wako na shida kubo kabisa juu utapata hindi wanatoka kujiju mwisho mbaka mwisho kwa hivyo kutulete hii ugonzwa ni yaraka na kama ni neighbors wale wajiwezi waweze kupata pia ya food juu unapata wale watu walikuwa naenda isili sa hii ya waendi job isili kumefungwa kwa hivyo unapata hakuna mtu anaenda kazi ni chenye uko nayo ni mshie na jirani ikiisha maisha tu yendele. kwa hivyo kama kuna zapatikana tu ile usajili watu wanaweza saidiwa nayo kwa community inaweza kuwa kuwa um, Julia highlights um, the importance of provision of sanitary towels mostly for women um, residing in these informal settlements, that has been a big issue. And uh, she she also says that there should be health talks in future for um, the youth and teenagers because they are the ones who are not controlled. So then they should be sensitized on the importance of such things. If there's such um, there's a pandemic like this again, uh, people people should social distance to um, keep. Uh, prevent themselves from spreading or rather bringing this uh, disease from one point to another. And um, she also pushes for more food drives because um, like um, you find that maybe there your neighbors don't have food to eat, you're not in a position to support them. Um, so if the government or any other organization that is in a position to come in and look out for the people can do that, then that will be very helpful for them. Thank you so much, Julia. Chaco? So, uh, assim como eu já tinha dito, nós da campanha do Jacarezinho contra o Corona estruturamos um laboratório de pesquisa, dados e narrativas para produzir conhecimento e potencializar as iniciativas que surgem da favela, né? So as uh, ha, uh, Thiago has mentioned before, they started a lab in order to gather uh, data from the favela so they can um, use that to build uh, to, to have it as a tool for empowerment. E nesse momento a gente está produzindo um documentário que vai tratar sobre essa campanha do Covid nas favelas do Rio de Janeiro e a partir disso a gente busca ampliar Thiago, essa so... produção. Thiago, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you repeat the last part, please, again? Ok. Uh, eu disse que nós estamos produzindo um documentário que vai tratar sobre essa campanha do Covid nas favelas do Rio de Janeiro. So they are producing now a documentary on the campaign that they are working uh, um, at the favela de Jacarezinho uh, to showcase what they are doing. E a partir disso, a partir da criação desse lab, desse laboratório, a gente busca ampliar a produção com foco em outros dados para que a favela saia desse lugar de invisibilidade. I'm sorry, Chago, can you repeat it? Eu disse que a gente tem focado em produzir mais dados para que o próprio Jacarezinho saia desse lugar de invisibilidade, até para que sejam viabilizadas políticas públicas para a favela, né? So, what he's hoping to do is, uh, with the data, they can leave the informality so they can be uh, looked into and have access to to the public service. Mas é, é muito importante também a gente tratar 
do desafio que é essa narrativa que está posta e retrata a favela como um local completamente marginal. I'm having really bad connection. I do apologize. Thiago, you need to repeat again. I apologize to everybody, especially to Thiago. Sem problemas, Tereza. Eu disse que, assim, é um desafio para nós é, tratar essa narrativa, né? Porque ela retrata a favela como um local completamente marginal. So their challenge is to uh, work on the narrative because the current narrative treats the favela as a marginalized place. E quando a gente trata de um lugar marginal, é, isso é um fator primordial para que a polícia, os agentes públicos se sintam é, ok, normais para legitimar o extermínio à nossa juventude, né? Ok, so if uh, if we're working on a marginalized place, if we are kept being seen as a uh, marginalized uh, place and, and people, uh, it kind of legitimizes uh, uh, the for maybe police force uh, to execute the youth and to to uh, um, exterminate the population. If they're marginalized, then they have no voice. So the challenge is to recreate this narrative uh, of a formal place. E eu digo que nós é, temos assim um exemplo dos Estados Unidos, no caso do George Floyd, né? Que recentemente nós perdemos um menino de 14 anos que foi morto por um tiro de fuzil pelas costas. E, e é isso, a gente lida com um absurdo no Brasil. A gente jamais poderia naturalizar isso. So, here in Brazil, we're dealing with absurdities. Uh, uh, recently, uh, we're seeing what's happening in the US with George Floyd's uh, execution by the police. But here in Brazil, this is a constant. We've just, we keep losing youth uh, and black youth. We lost João Pedro, who was uh, a youngster from uh, favela who was executed with the, uh, with the machine gun shots uh, behind his back. É isso, quando eu, quando eu digo que a gente tem dados absurdos, nós temos a polícia que mais mata no mundo. E além when, dessa... When Thiago says that we have absurd data, uh, what he means by that is that we have worldwide um, the police that has most executions under their belt. E aí, né, quando a gente fala em violência, que não é só essa violência bélica, fala também da violência simbólica, que é a falta de saneamento básico, de moradia digna, de creche, de escola, da falta de apoio mesmo na luta contra o coronavírus, a gente ainda tem so, que encarar. So when we're talking about violence here, uh, uh, we're not just talking about uh, bélic or, or armed uh, violence, we're talking about violence, such, uh, uh, symbolic violence, such as not having access to school, Uh, having access to sanitation uh, and basic services. Chago, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you specifically for, I think, making the connection um, between violence um, in communities like this in Brazil and in the US and a variety of other settings against Black um, young people men and women. So thank you for making that connection. And I think for highlighting that even in something like a pandemic, these are, um, these are sometimes opportunities for governments to take advantage and utilize their power and their force. Um, and so to even sort of upgrade the violence that they have been involved in before the pandemic. And as um, public health practitioners and social workers and all of these other roles that we're all playing, that we have to be aware of that and ready to, um, to intervene, prevent, and react. So thank you for highlighting that component of the work. Uh, Zahira, may I interrupt just a second? I think Chago wants to say a couple of, uh, a, few, a few last words on his statement. Please. Is that okay? Yes, please. Chago, go Sorry, ahead. Sorry, uh, No, I was going to conclude by saying that é isso, a gente tem 
a morte, vários casos aqui no Brasil, como o João Pedro, a Agatha, o Marcos Vinícius, Maria Eduarda, a própria Marielle, né? E dentre vários outros que tiveram a vida ceifada num país que quer passar a impressão de que vive uma democracia racial. So he's, he's... Oh, I think you're muted. He's saying that Maria uh, Eduardo is a worldwide uh, known case of police brutality uh, uh, and political brutality against marginalized people. E, e aí a gente meio que se pergunta que democracia racial é essa, porque a cada 23 minutos no Brasil, morre um jovem negro, né? E aí a nossa luta é principalmente para preservar a vida nas favelas e dessa juventude. Nós consigamos continuar lutando. So, we have to ask ourselves what kind of uh, democracy is this uh, and racialized democracy this is. Every 23 minutes, we lose uh, a life of young black people here in Brazil. So, what is this? democracy that we're talking about. Great, thank you so much, Teresa, for your translation, Chago, for your responses and your real connection to a global movement um, against this kind of violence. Thank you. Esther? Well, I will be brief because I think Chago uh, said everything. Um, and I will only add that what I hope for this post-COVID-19 era is that all the knowledge and power that is being embraced in the fight against the COVID-19 in the communities is able to express itself in political terms and in order to enlarge our democracy and face the problem of violence among many other problems. Thank you so much, Esther. So I appreciate, um, I think, the level of detail and the level of description about the work that's happening on the ground. I know many of us have been in webinar after webinar after webinar on this topic of COVID-19, but I think the perspectives you're hearing are quite different than the perspectives we've been hearing in a lot of other experiences like this. Um, from the front line, from the ground, about what is happening, what is needed, and what historical dynamics are influencing whether people live and survive or whether they don't in this experience. Um, I'd like to thank Chago, Esther, and Julia for this dynamic conversation. We wanted to transition to the Q&A component with our colleagues and friends online, and it looks like we have a number of good questions. So I'm going to jump right into that, and then we'll come back to the panel for their final statements um, before closing out the session. So questions, comments, concerns are welcome in the chat as we move through this Q&A component. Um, the first question I wanted to highlight here um, comes from Professor Samantha Winter, and um, she says, Chago, it is great to hear that communities themselves are collecting data. Um, can you talk about the way the data um, will be shared given the challenges of misinformation? So let's start there. Chago, should I translate the question to you? Pode traduzir, por favor, Tereza. Sim, a professora, a, a, a professora de Colômbia, Samantha Winter, te pergunta como que vocês vão compartilhar os dados que vocês estão coletando agora. Como vocês pretendem compartilhar e usar os dados? Bom, é, inicialmente a gente pretende não não estou conseguindo te ouvir Thiago pode repetir ah, me por ouve gentileza agora? sim sim é, inicialmente nós pretendemos usar esses dados na produção do documentário é, a gente pretende fazer um relatório e uma cartilha 
de tudo que a gente está relatando aqui no Jacarezinho contra o Covid-19 e publicar nas redes ou até academicamente mesmo. Ok, so he's saying that um, they'll use the data that they're gathering to uh, produce the, doc the documentary that they are working on and they're hoping to uh, write a formal report uh, that they are hoping to share through social media and maybe even through the academia here in Brazil. There's another question here um, to Julia. So Julia, apart from um, government interventions and NGO interventions, I think this person wants to know a little bit more about other types of community response. Um, can you describe other kinds of community responses that are not government and not NGO um, that are happening in Mudare or Kibera? Okay, Lena, can I, Lena can uh, translate? Yeah, sure. Um, apart from um, vitu ambavyo serikali mefanya na NGO, kwa ikiusiana na ya mamba ya COVID-19, kuna vitu vingina ambavyo nyinyi kama jamii mefanya, ama watu wengine wa mefanya kuwasaidia kupitia huu wakati. Yes. Okay, tumekuwa na talks. Juu kuna watu wako in depression, juu wamepoteza kazi, familia ina matarajia, ana mbele ana nyuma. Huu mtu wako kwa depression. At the end of the day unapata mtu kama si mzee ameko commit suicide ni mama. Kwa hivyo mental health ya maana sana kwetu. Na unapata watu wengi wale saa hii wanatabika, wanatabika juu ya depression na mental um, Julia is saying that uh, there, there have been other issues that have not like been on the front line, like mental health related issues. Uh, so here the community has come together. There as the people who reside in Madari have come together and they're giving each other social support, helping each other uh, go through this time. Uh, because she's like, there are some cases that have been reported on people committing suicide, um, issues arising within the families uh, due to this pandemic and the stress that it has caused. Uh, so that is one of the ways that the community has come together to address this. Excellent. Thank you so much, Julia. A question for you, um, Esther. So this person asks um, if you can particularly speak a bit about what's happening in Sao Paulo um, and particularly the community-based organizations in that city. Um, who are they and what are they doing? Um, considering, this person says, considering that this is the epicenter of the virus in Brazil, can you speak specifically to Sao Paulo? Yes. Well, it's a big challenge to, uh, as I said before, um, to uh, in, uh, to realize the confinement because it's hard in the communities for people to understand and, and to actually stay home. And a lot of community work has been done. And I think as Tiago said, it's the grassroots efforts that are making the difference here because there's no public policy for the favelas. When the government uh, speaks about the, the policies and the plans and what is to be done, they don't have a specific policy for favelas and for informal settlements um, because they're not used to working inside these places. So there are a number of initiatives that are making the difference. Um, like in Paraisopolis, which is the second largest um, favela in Sao Paulo, there's a strong initiative that um, uh, working with very, um, with they, they elected representatives in each street 
um, so they have street representatives to um, to work with the people to distribute um, food and to teach them how to wash the hand, their hands and stuff like that. They have like local places where they, um, like they have transformed the local schools in places to receive the people who have mild versions of COVID-19 in order to keep them from spreading the disease uh, to other people in the community. Um, also, there are a number of initiatives that already exist and that have um, coped with the virus. And like uh, what I was saying before, Conzilla is a very popular funk um, YouTube channel and they have music videos addressing the challenges facing COVID. Um, there are another initiatives such as Desabafo Social with um, other institutes that are hoping to fund people. And I think Thiago should look for funding in this, um, in this organization. They're, they're hoping to fund people to make their own videos uh, in order to find the right language and the right terms to stimulate people to stay home. Um, also, there are numbers of like, the initiatives come from very different ideological and they're very different um, um, backgrounds of churches are very involved and um, there are a number of solidarity initiatives um, working in but as I said before it's very fragmented there is a very a strong um, organization in Sao Paulo called Uni Afro um, and they they have like links in neighborhoods in different neighborhoods so they are helping a lot to distribute food. Food is the first, um, as Julia said, and I think in Brazil it's the same, food is the first um, thing like we have uh, to avoid um, people dying for lack of, lack of food. So we have to distribute food besides um, trying to help people to find their own ways of, of keeping with the confinement rule. Uh, we also have, um, uh, I didn't say this before, but I wanted to be sure of talking about the indigenous people uh, who are, at the one hand, they are the ones who are more familiar with the confinement rule because they are used after centuries of dying um, of viruses that uh, brought by the white people. Um, they are used to um, to being to isolating themselves when there is an epidemic. So they were the first ones to retire, to disappear, to try to disappear, to try to avoid contact with the white. So, um, and in some cases they have been successful, in others uh, the virus has arrived, but uh, in some cases they, they have built, um, immunity in other cases they are dealing with loss as everybody else um, so the the difficulties are immense because they're very diverse situations and i'm talking about the indigenous people because in sao paulo we also have indigenous people um, the indigenous peoples in brazil are not only in the amazon although main of uh, although most of them are but in Sao Paulo, we also have indigenous communities. Um, so I want to highlight the heterogeneity of the situation here and the 
immense challenge that we face and the most scandalous um, I think the COVID-19 is bringing up world inequalities in very strong ways and as one of the most unequal country in the world Brazil has to do has to deal with this um, problem and I hope that in the future um, we manage to do better in fighting our inequality because that's where the root of all the problems we have lies. Thank you so much, Esther, Chago, Julia. Um, we are uh, delighted to have been able to engage with you to learn more about your expertise, both as po people who are living within informal settlements and working within, within informal settlements. Thank you all for your amazing questions. Um, and please join me through the chat in thanking our panelists for a rich and honest discussion on the life in informal settlements under the pressure and difficulties created by coronavirus. Um, the, this group of, of people could have been doing anything today and but decided to spend time with us teaching and learning. And so I personally feel grateful and I know that you do too. And we've had a chance to hear so much about the fragmentation in response, but also in the power of community. Um, as Esther closed, we talked, uh, she got to highlight how much this is shining a light on inequality and inequity across the globe and how, much, how important this moment is for recognizing that and dismantling oppression in all the settings that it has manifested. Um, I thank you, Chago, for highlighting the narrative and the, ch and the need to change narrative and the way that you're doing that in your own work and letting us know that expertise exists among black and brown youth all across the globe and in favelas in Brazil. Um, thank you, Julia, for bringing out the power that exists in Mudare and that exists in Kibeta and for highlighting the kinds of marginalization and the kinds of issues that, are, um, that need to be um, responded to and reacted to whether a pandemic is taking place or not. Um, I'd also like to thank our viewers uh, the Columbia Global Centers, the Columbia School of Social Work. Um, with that said, obrigado a Santini Sana, Murakozi Chane for your time, your attention, and your thoughtfulness. Um, wherever you are in the world, I wish you good health, peace of mind, and above all else, justice. Pauline? Pauline? Um, I'll jump in if, if Pauline isn't available. Um, I can represent Pauline as part of the Global Centers. We would like to immensely uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McNatt, for this wonderful moderation. Uh, it's, you have done a fantastic job in coordinating everyone, uh, uh, in showcasing um, uh, very uh, uh, fine and robust uh, um, condensation of the conversation. So thank you so much on behalf of the Global mm -hmm. Centers. Um, and thank you so much for our, all our panelists. I would like to, to just finally uh, invite everybody. This is the first webinar of a three part um, series. So the next two Mondays, we will be discussing COVID and mental health and COVID and stigma all within the frame of informal settlements. So you're all uh, welcome to, to join and we encourage you to join. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank, thank Dr. Samantha Winter from the School of Social Work at Columbia, who's managed to get everyone together uh, and working on this, um, on this series for all of us. And final, final word, I promise, I would like to uh, apologize to Chago if I wasn't able to do uh, uh, a correct uh, and an whole translation of his content, which is so rich and so important here in Brazil right now. Uh, his voice uh, needs to be heard, uh, uh, and so does the voice of uh, young Black people here in Brazil who are suffering immensely uh, under this 
insane uh, context that the world and Brazil is uh, living um, right now. So I do apologize, Thiago. I hope uh, I can eventually um, give you a wider voice and a more uh, um, uh, a better translation. So thanks everybody, and I hope to see you in the next webinars, uh, the next two Mondays. Dr. McNatt. Thank you all. With that said, um, we look forward to seeing you in the next webinars. Have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.